Hello, everybody, and welcome to What's Next, our podcast and blog series about startups and innovation. My name is Giovanni Vacari. I am the head of product here at Startup Bootcamp. And today, we will be interviewing our luminous Moby Train, represented by their founder and CEO, Guy Van Neck. Moby Train is the number one mobile micro learning app for your frontline teams, revolutionizing workplace training with mobile first micro learning. Their mission is to empower all employees with the right content at the right time on the device they prefer to help them succeed in their professional and personal development. Guy, welcome and thank you for taking the time. Hi, Gio. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here again after uh, maybe three years. So uh, great. Yeah. Well, three years ago, you, you've you been to start a bootcamp, but first you founded your company. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, so sure. Far? Uh, maybe first of all, I always had a dream to start my own company. So even before that, when I worked at uh, other companies just as an employee, it always felt like it's my own company. So it was something in me. Um, but it was 14, I was working at an American uh, company in, in auditing and mystery shopping services. Um, where I worked with a lot of retailers around the globe in order to improve their customer service and experience. And by mm -hmm. doing that, we got quite a lot of data. And from those data, you saw that it was extremely difficult for them to train people really in, in the front line. So there is quite a lot of attention to management. Uh, they get trainings face-to-face uh, -face or via other channels, but the people that are really in the stores, they were often a little bit limited. That started to grow in my mind. So like, yeah, what can we do to change this? Of course, you had uh, the, the, the smartphones coming in, more digitalization. So I thought, let's make a, a platform, as you beautifully described at the beginning of this podcast, that's going mobile first and where we can reach those people in a much more fun and engaging way. At that time, I was also doing my MBA at Chicago Boot. And that was a, let's say, push because there you could do a, a business plan, uh, prepare it, get a lot of feedback from VCs, fees from people from, yeah, she could self. And that's where we basically made the, the plan to do this. Uh, we got very good feedback. And then we said in 2015, yeah, let's really do it. And let's start the company. But at that time, it was still very uh, slow, I would say, in that sense that I was still having my other job. So we really started next to it to observe the market and step-by-step step getting to where we are now. And then 2018, you joined Starter Bootcamp. And uh, how was that experience for you and it your was, team? It, it was a great experience. Like often in an entrepreneurial journey, it, it consists of all uh, yeah, small or big steps, depends on how you see it. Yeah. And then step by step, you get to a certain path. And at that time, uh, we had the first ID. We got some very good feedback, some really beta customers, but not really uh, uh, fleshed out. And then we, we said, we heard about this. They approached us at, at one of the conferences uh, with Startup Bootcamp and said, why not? And then we came here, did the, did the first day uh, to do the pitches, got also a lot of good feedback from that. And then we got selected. And that's a new starting point because we had some new employees where their first day, Christophe is still with us, was actually here in Amsterdam. He started oh, nice. at Motrain and the first thing he did coming to Amsterdam, uh, being here in an apartment and spent the next three months here. So it was a, a special experience and, and we got a lot of uh, yeah positive outcomes from the from the program actually. Yeah, because ever since then you, you got I think 60 clients if I'm correct. Yeah, so actually 2018 was the last uh, bit to to sharpen our pitch to exactly know what is now what we want to do. Yeah, uh, It helped us to prepare for our first real funding round, which we did at the beginning of 2019. And that was also the moment when I came full-time in the company. And since that moment, we grew. Yeah, last time uh, we multiplied, uh, last year we multiplied by four. And this year also wow. we're, we're on track to, to get yeah nearly to yeah, three times uh, our revenue from last year. So we're really at a high growth pace now. Um, and that started actually, or, or the, the, the first steps were here at uh, the Startup Bootcamp. But of course, growing this much doesn't come without a, a cost. What are the growing pains that, you, that you've learned and that you've noticed in the past? Uh, probably for many people or many companies, it will always be the same things. Um, so first of all, it's always important to find the right people huh? because you can get and raise money and that's great, but then you want to do something with it. So in our case, one example, we, we want to get uh, an, our engineering team bigger. Yeah. Uh, we have our engineering team in Lisbon and it was quite difficult to find the, the right people. We're quite picky, so we really want to have great quality, but that means that it sometimes takes more time than what you thought. Yeah, um, sometimes the most expensive uh, is not always the best either, right? No, that's also true. So that that's definitely one thing. 
the other piece and and yeah that's process and procedures huh? in the beginning it's all pure entrepreneurial we're still mm -hmm. uh, early scale up so it's not that we're that big but you want to get more procedures in place more processes in place uh, we got last year our iso certificate <clears throat> yeah we need to do thank you very much we need to do a lot of effort getting it but it brought us to that next step so these are some of the things that we see um but luckily we have quite an uh yeah i would say senior management team very data driven and and that's how we try to overcome those things uh, that come together with growth and it's really interesting that you bring uh, again certification because we just had an alumnus uh, last week here and they say the same thing that you know getting those certificates getting those certifications get, going through um th those processes actually they're super hard or sometimes a big pain but they do make you a better company mm -hmm. sometimes they're just like a roadmap and you think oh i have to do this to get the certificate but actually you know they just make you stronger true and and for me to a certain extent it's the same thing with funding rounds uh, people mm -hmm. often say like yeah we need to get funding it's a painful process but the more you talk with VCs, they're not always right, <laughs> but <laughs> they make you think and they challenge you. And some do it in a brutal way, some do it in a decent way, but it helps you as a team to reflect, uh, to have discussions with the team. Like, yeah, do we agree with that? What do we think about it? Mm -hmm. And I've seen it always as a very positive and it pushes us in the, in the right direction. And you've also grew um, to different countries, right? I think 30 right now, uh, mm -hmm. but where you're where active in, where the services of MobiTrain are deployed to. Mm -hmm. um, how is it to navigate all these different cultures? And I mean, growing to so many countries, that's a very European thing, right? You get to a lot of different cultures very fast. Yeah. How has that been? It's, it's double. On the one hand, um, it went very organically because many of our customers, they are international, so you just follow them. So it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we're active in 30 countries that we have 30 offices. Eh? Most of those customers, eh? most of those customers no. we can really support from our head office in, in Belgium. Um, of course, that meant we have, for example, in Middle East, uh, some customers. It's, it's a different way. It's, it's more, uh, let's say, mainstream you need to be closer to those customers so you see differences but for us luckily and also i think a little bit uh, due to covid people are really getting into a modus where you can do a lot digital so for us it's it's quite easy to serve customers in multiple countries from one or two locations and now we're in the phase that we're really opening small let's say sales offices mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna go now to spain uh, that's gonna be a office we have netherlands of course um, and we're also planning on, on Italy. So these are some of the markets where in our yeah, chase for becoming a European market leader that we mm -hmm. say, instead of going via France and Germany, we rather pick uh, other countries where we believe that we can have a faster and a bigger impact yeah. at a very efficient way. And also, come on, great weather as well, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I cannot say that here, eh? but it's it's always yeah. <laughs> something we're looking at. It's the same thing with Dubai. There are worse places to, to go to uh, of course. And, and to yeah. do business. But that's, of course, not the most important criterion. No, 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 no. I, I get that. And um, for you, how do you keep? How do you? How did you keep the culture going during the well, the COVID pandemic? Yeah, it, it was quite a challenge because in the beginning, and that was two thousand twenty. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We we just raised a new capital round. So we were really fully into it. Yeah, what are we going to do? Ah, quite busy. Yeah. And you were so much, uh, or I was so much focused on growth. Like, yeah, we need to grow. We need to find customers. And now we have the pandemic that maybe there was not enough time to really be there with the teams uh, yeah. and connect uh, via virtual way, but do it on a, on a quite yeah, regular moment. And that came as feedback from the team. And that was good that we spoke about it, I think, two months later. And, and you felt in the team, yeah, something is not right. Mm -hmm. So we put it on the table and then we changed that. And I think nowadays we, we feel a very good vibe. Um, we do more regular catch-ups, not only official catch-ups, but also just it can be a Friday beer uh, from oh, the developer nice. side, et cetera, et cetera, but all online. And now we're looking forward to that uh, hopefully in a few months, uh, we're planning now a real team team building, which we did also two years ago, where we can bring everybody together uh, from all the offices. So. Frontline workers, we can, it took a whole nother level, right, of the meaning of the word uh, during this, this the, the, the past two years as well. How did MobiTrain respond to that? Yeah, originally when we came out of the program, um, our proposition was very much for focused towards retail huh? because mm -hmm. I had that back retail. you have a lot of frontline employees. Yeah, but no retail then uh, during the pandemic. Correct. And now <laughs> luckily we had some very strong clients on board, which we still have. So mm -hmm. for them, 
pandemic or no pandemic, uh, they took it often as an opportunity to even do more learning and to put things in place for after the pandemic. So we were lucky, I think, with, with good clients. In the meantime, we see also that retail is picking up again and that yeah. uh, definitely physical retail is not dead. Uh, no. I, I've always said that. But uh, even the beginning of the pandemic, people say e-commerce. Yeah, of course, e-commerce is important, but it's still there. So we are very positive about it. But as you said, during the pandemic, it was, of course, a very difficult uh, year. And we saw that quite a lot of other industries turned to our solution. And that opened also our eyes. Uh, things which we didn't expect, maybe. It could be consulting companies, uh, where we see oh, really? even from the big four that, that came to us, sometimes for change processes where they mm -hmm. said, yeah, we want to build more awareness with our employees in a fun and engaging way. Some do it more from a customer experience point of view. How can we make sure that our employees have good customer service uh, techniques and how can we build awareness for, around those things? Uh, government um, and police here in the Netherlands, uh, we see cities, the city of Rotterdam, city of Antwerp. So to cut the long story short, basically we are now yeah, redefining a little bit our proposition and seeing it's not it's definitely not only retail, but it's it's sometimes more like companies that are in a sort of growth phase, that are dynamic, that uh, put the people first, that really want to invest in, in their people. Um, and they're looking for a, a very easy, fun tool to use with direct impact. And that broadens uh, the lot. Um, and that's also what we see in our client base. Yeah, because if you think about it, frontline is not just, you know, the the, the, the point of, of, of sale. It's also your, the face of your company, right? If you have a bad experience with a, with a, somebody in the casa, you're not going to blame the person. You're going to blame the brand. Correct. It, it attaches yeah. such a such an important meaning. And that's yeah. in all industries. Yeah. And, and frontline, it's not always only frontline. It can also be more just remote. And eh? we see also in logistics, uh, for example, a lot of people that are in the field and eh? they're yeah. not always with customers, but there are in the, there are in the field or their worker house. They're not that easy to reach. Eh? They work in shifts. So that are all things that make it more difficult. And as a consequence, often those people don't get a lot of opportunities to, to get trained or to get new learnings. That's where definitely we see um, also a lot of uh, growth. Yeah, and there is a lot of new protocols and procedures. So something like that is, is very needed and something like Mobby Train. What I wanted to ask you as well is about micro learning. Mm -hmm. I am the biggest fan of micro learning there is. And how did you see um, the results of micro learning? Like how, how, how much more impact it is versus, you know, those two hour workshop videos that. Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, there are a lot of misconceptions, I think, about microlearning. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people, if they hear microlearning, they think, okay, it's just five minutes or 10 minutes maximum. And then I had that little nugget and that's it. Now you can do many different things and you can use it in many different ways. Oh. So one way of looking at it is if you have a lot of knowledge to share is to see what is really critical knowledge to share versus less critical. Uh, if I take where they should not spend the time because you yeah. can fully do it digital. People can look it up when they need it, uh, also work instructions. So it's that combination where you see that micro learning can be used in, in multiple ways for very complex topics, enforcement, or as a preparation to a face-to-face -face session. And in other cases, it's the only way to, to do it. I love that you meant um, well, health, because a lot of people think that that that's not a place for startups, right? Because you can't really iterate or you can't build an MVP mm -hmm. <laughs> with uh, health. But there are many ways that you can implement the methodology and, and the way of thinking of a startup. And I think it's super cool as well when you when they're probably drafting the, the content and they're drafting that. It, it is also better to choose indeed which ones are the most relevant ones, like which ones we need to make sure that they get. Yeah. Like you really reach the right content at the right people. Correct. Yeah. Nice. And uh, you raised recently... 4 million euros mm -hmm. I have here uh, written down, correct? Correct, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, that must feel very good. Uh, for sure. That was a nice thing. And it's also nice to see that, yeah, the further we go, I would not say the easier, but it's a different process. Eh? So in the beginning, mm -hmm. it's, a it's a lot of really convincing people about the ID. And definitely in learning, it's not easy because the learning space is a quite crowded place. Um, Maybe I was a little bit naive in it at the beginning because I didn't come from the learning space itself. I just saw a business problem. Um, but then once you get into it, you have a lot of investors who say like, no, it's too crowded. But when you go a bit deeper, then you really see that with what you do, you really are not in such a crowded space. Um, and I think we prove it now with the, with the growth that we have. And that means that now you see it in a, in a reverse 
uh, direction that you get more and more attention from investors. So mm -hmm. let's say even on a weekly basis, because they're looking for projects where, where they see the growth, where they feel that the market is big and definitely the market is big. And everything that happened now with Corona, it's definitely not good. But for our business and in our area, it, it puts uh, definitely a tailwind there. Um, yeah. And that's also on the investor side. It's interesting, as again, that you say, yeah, I'm not from that industry. But I don't think you need to be from an industry in order to start a startup. In that, I mean, having mentors in that industry is definitely relevant. Like, did you experience that as well? Um, I think in, in general, um, mentors, it comes from different angles and eh? not only for the industry expertise. Of course, yeah, you need to have people that can support you. And that also comes from the networking. That's one of the things I really liked about Startup Bootcamp. Uh, for example, our CFO, Marcel, I met Marcel here at the program and he's now our CFO and had a tremendous impact on all the rounds we did so far and in general to our operations. Um, the same thing with uh, experience in building um, a, a learning, learning tool. tool. I am not a developer, I didn't have the learning background, but we could in the beginning get really, really nice uh, people on board uh, as independents, but with the right knowledge to build the tool. So yeah, finding the right people also at the right time is crucial. And there, the more you get outside, the more you meet people, the better the chances that you, you get across those people. Nice. I see, I hear the police passing mm -hmm. by. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's not for me, I hope. No, <laughs> <laughs> they found you, Guy, they found you. No, but um, no, I definitely understand. And I think that's also why, you know, at Startup Bootcamp, we make it such a such an important part. I think it's the first week of the program. We already introduced you to a bunch of mentors to try and see which connections are valuable. Um, and I'm happy to hear that that, that it still no. works out. It's really nice. For, your, for raising your capital, just going a little bit back to it, how long did it take you to raise this four million? Now, this round went uh, pretty fast because um, if I'm not mistaken, we started at, let's say, beginning of February. You always have a little bit of preparation, of course. Mm. But the better your processes get, the better your, yeah, every month reporting is, yeah, then that preparation is also not that difficult. Um, and um, we closed, I think, in May. So it was a pretty short period. Uh, we gave a lot of, uh, we took, let's say, ownership of the process. We approached a lot of parties where we had built already some relationship over the years. And we told them like, look, this is the, the framework. Within that time frame, we want to close uh, this round. And basically everybody uh, did that and jumped on it. And, and yeah, we had very good traction with it. And for other founders out there that are looking to fundraise, do you have any tips and tricks? I did already a webinar on that here with Startup Bootcamp, oh, so yes. definitely watch that watch webinar. That one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah it, and it all depends on who you are. So but there are a few things that are always there and not a surprise, I think, but first one, preparation. I mean, the better you prepare it, the better you have a good deck that directly speaks uh, to the people, uh, a short one as a teaser, but then afterwards a more in-depth one. Yeah, the, the better, of course. Then also take your time because now this round went quite uh, fast for us. But if you look at the beginning, when we came from the program here and closing around, it took much longer. So if you, and that's one of the, I think, common mistakes that people really ran out of money because they think, yeah, in three or four months time, I will invest and close everything. You will find an investor, but sometimes they don't have the time. They're just very busy. And many of those investors, they don't have teams of uh, 30 or 40 people. So if they're just busy with a few deals, then you can have a fantastic idea and they like it, but they just don't have the time. So really prepare, take your time and, and then uh, be persistent because it's just like in sales, you will get more no's than yeses. And it's not because uh, seven people tell you that this idea will not work or they think it's the, the market is too crowded that uh, there will not be two others who say like, yeah, I really like this and I believe in it. Now, um, on a personal level as well, mm -hmm. how did you balance all of this? For me, it's um, sometimes it's challenging, of course, like uh, everything, it's really a roller coaster. Huh? All the things that they mentioned about startups and scale-ups, you read it in books, but then if you really see it, uh, then, then yeah, it is like that. Definitely when you take also uh, capital via a VC or whatever, then you always have that pressure, not from the VC itself, because we never had any difficult or, or bad discussions, but you put yourself that pressure, like you want to grow yeah. fast. So, so you don't yeah. want to disappoint the people that need in you. Yeah. So every month you want to see that and that puts, I think that helps you to really push it and to, to go mm -hmm. uh, faster, but it also brings, of course, that stress. For me personally, it's, it's uh, a few things, sports, uh, making time to really deconnect. 
uh, via is it running everybody has their own thing and for me is it sports and different sports so that's what i like to do uh, then family and friends and and just deconnect i think too many times i hear still that people say like yeah if you do a startup it's uh seven days a week it's 24 hours you cannot rest you always need to be on i i can say in the beginning for sure there were many nights and there are many ways <laughs> where you really go fully but also taking a step back sometimes helps a lot to generate new ideas to come back in a more fresh way and and help the team in a much better way to being yeah. there every day uh 24 hours yeah but it's something we say here to founders as well you know it's an investment Mm -hmm. Sometimes taking a little break can also be an investment because True. It, it's much better that you take a day off and you come back recharged and you come back, you know, with a good energy than you're just like constantly passing on that stressful energy to your team as well, or that unrested energy to your team. Like they're going to look up to you. They're going to, you know, emulate your uh, yeah. behaviors as well. Yeah. And, and as founders, it goes, yeah, also all together with, with uh, delegation and being able to gives things to other people and and of course hire good people but then also trust those people and yeah sometimes i see a lot of people who cannot do that and then yeah of course then you don't get there with seven days and 24 hours because then even at that moment the work is not done yeah, but um, also trusting there is a part of trusting that will require failure mm -hmm. you've got to give them a space to fail as well because otherwise you know they're never going to get it right the first time for sure and <clears throat> that's something i think also in the journey you need to phase that not everything perfect from day one um, <laughs> although you want it but uh, it's not like that and step by step you get more knowledge now in our case uh, in the beginning you can think this will work but you still have very little data points to really know if it works and that's what i really like about this journey where we are now uh, that you get to a point where you get more data points and you can discuss about it and really see like wow uh, we didn't know it up front, but now we see that these and these are some elements that come together. And each time when we do that, it has a success. So how can we do it more often and in a better uh, and a more efficient way? You know, optimizing that, that the whole process, yeah. which is said in the beginning, right? Setting up processes and then optimizing them. Yeah. Oh, that's really nice. And if you could go back in time, mm -hmm. um, which advice would you give yourself when you started? Um, maybe that um, I should have gone faster in the beginning i mean myself i eh, put myself more uh, full-time in it but it's a double one because on the one hand uh, i also hear a lot that when people do a startup they say you need to go all in from day one mm -hmm. um, but it has a lot to do with the timing and for some mm -hmm. startups that will be right because the timing is now and if you wait two more years you're too late yeah but if i look back to our case on the one hand i would have jumped earlier and i would have liked to do that and maybe we would be a bit further but on the other hand if you see like how the market was evolving it's now with what happened with corona that it really got a push but otherwise it was still early mobile learning some people he even don't have digital learning at all let's say that they really focus on mobile um so it it depends a little bit so that's one of um the points yeah for the rest it's more I, i'm a bit lucky i think with the team that uh, from the beginning we had a very uh, strong team and so far and touching wood we didn't had really uh, big uh, drawbacks so it's not that something happened from a big um, yeah size that i would say like damn i should have done that completely different it were more small iterations things where you said like oh this is not working um, but it's more like that iteration process that happens. And what's the mistake that you learned the most from, or one of the mistakes? Um, yeah, one of the, the, the things that you could say is that going faster um, on sales in the sense that building that sales team in a, in a faster way not meaning like having 10 or 15 people because uh but but trying to have uh, multiple touch points where you get more data from because till last year most of the sales came via myself and also jasper our uh, chief commercial uh, officer but we didn't really have a sales team if you look at everything that you could say from all that money that we had maybe we should have gone a bit faster on that side then now we should have already more data points which we're now getting so that's for me the only thing where i would say and you often hear it, but if you're yourself into that sales process, maybe that's not the first thing you want to do, but we should have gone a bit faster there. But Guy, I uh, love what you say, data point. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because sales is just, you know, money, the, the PNL. Uh, most people think about just the financial return, but actually indeed, especially if you 
are a startup, you should be gathering those data points because it not always means recurring business, mm -hmm. but it can mean a great opportunity to learn and to collect those. Yeah, every person that walks out there has a connection with uh, customers, you get feedback eh? because maybe they don't buy, but then why they don't buy and why is it not working? And in the beginning, often you don't know it up front, but then you see like, eh, now our sales rep in, in Belgium, he made a lot of uh, deals in a short period of time. And if you then analyze those deals, you start to see patterns. Mm -hmm. You cannot see that if you have, at the beginning, you have only 20 clients. Okay, we went after retail, so we know in retail it works. But outside of retail, we didn't have a lot of uh, points. So, yeah, I, I always said it. Sales is just much more than somebody who can talk and explain a nice story. Sales is a process um, where it's, it's a quite detailed and complex process. But the more uh, you can work on it and with the more data, I'm, I'm very convinced that you can turn it really into a machine. And, and that's what we, we try to do. And uh, what do you still want to learn? With every stage that you go in, you learn new things. And that's the nice thing. Eh? Originally, it was really getting it off the ground. Um, now we're getting in a stage where you're saying like, okay, we know that it's not just uh, luck and that we got a few clients. No, there is definitely a need in the market. We have a product. Now you get into that new stage, like how can we scale this in, the, yeah, in a very fast way? And that comes together with a complete new set of, uh, of challenges. And I'm sure if we get that right, and there is again a new journey. Yeah? For example, in, in the learning market, as I said, it's a quite um, scattered landscape with a lot of uh, players. So there is also a lot of opportunity to consolidate. Yeah? And, and do you want to play a role in that consolidation, which would bring you more into M&A? So another playing field where I don't have experience with yet. So yeah, from that point of view, I'm, I'm uh, very confident that there's still a lot to learn and that uh, if we do this journey right, uh, hopefully we will see a lot of those uh, points. Nice. Well, I look forward for Start Bootcamp and uh, for me as well to be a part of uh, further on with the Moby Train journey. And I thank you very much for coming to this session. My pleasure. Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for taking the time to be here with, the, with us today. This was What's Next. If you want to follow us, we are everywhere. Great podcasts are found. We're also on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, the whole shtick. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, share with your friends. And we will be back next week with another episode. Thank you for coming.